a lot or, or to think critically about things. In fact, in, in many religious contexts, um, if you question what the pastor says or question what the church believes or question the church tradition, well, you'll be looked at with suspicious eyes and maybe even meet a lot of hostility. Uh, that is not our attitude here at Woodland Hills Church. Just want you to know that. Uh, we don't think that God asks us to check our brain at the door when we come in. In fact, what I see in Scripture is that God encourages us to think. That's one of the ways we worship God with all of our mind. And you'll find heroes throughout the Bible who, who wrestled with God, and they questioned God, and they questioned things. And I don't think God is offended by that. I, I think in some ways that can be a sign. Some people think that questioning is the opposite of faith, and I don't think that for a moment. Sometimes not questioning is a sign that you don't really care. You don't care enough to think about stuff. Uh, and so God is okay with our questioning and we're called to be people who are honest. And I think if you're honest and you're a thinking person, you're going to have questions about stuff. We're to get all of our life from Jesus Christ, not from all of our theological opinions, which is important because if you're getting life from being right about everything, including your view of hell, well, then the minute I or anyone else questions it, you're going to get angry. You'll also find that it's impossible for you to learn anything because your life is in believing, is found in believing that you already know. I know they say that if you want to build a big church, you don't want to cause a lot of, you know, you stay away from controversial issues. You don't want to cause a lot of questioning. People don't like to. They've done studies on this. The average person doesn't like to be forced to think a lot. And so you just state things as though everything was clear and unambiguous and, and convince people that what they believe is the truth and that's what they want. And as a matter of fact, I have gotten more than a few emails from people who have told me that they don't like to come to the church anymore because... They don't like to go someplace where some of their traditional beliefs are going to be questioned or where they're forced to think and question their traditional beliefs. It irritates them. Which is a great policy if you can assume that everything you've ever been taught is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Yeah, fine. Well, then you don't have to think about anything anymore. But lucky you, the one person on the planet who got it all in eighth grade and Sunday school class. The rest of us have to wonder about what is true. My working assumption is that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, and I try to get my thought to line up with the, 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 the biblical teaching. But I'm not always convinced that what people think the Bible teaches is what the Bible actually teaches. And so it is okay. We've got to kind of give each other some slack here. We may agree or disagree, but it's okay to wonder out loud as an honest person with the text. That's not a lack of faith. That's a sign of faith. Now, in this passage, this guy is being tortured. There's no other really way, way of putting it. He's in fire, but the fire doesn't burn him up. It just torments him. He cries out for pity. The least gesture he'd be thankful for. If, if Lazarus would just dip his finger in the water and put it on his tongue, it would cool it for a second. And that's all this guy hopes for. Apparently his tongue is burning up. He's beyond thirst. He's tortured. He cries out for a little bit of mercy. The text doesn't say this, but the traditional interpretation holds that that exquisite, excruciating torture goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. After 40 trillion, trillion years, 40 trillion epochs, you're no closer to being done with the exquisite torture than you were the first second you began to experience it. That's the traditional view. And this text is among a few texts that have been used to inspire that vision of hell. It's been used to inspire most of the art of, uh, on hell throughout the Middle Ages. You go to some of the old cathedrals in Europe and you'll see some of the most exquisite scenes of hell you can imagine. And some artists painted absolutely uh, nightmarish, ghoulish, macabre pictures of, uh, of hell. I was going to show a few of those, but we decided that they were just too pornographic. <laughs> Uh, to, to, to show here. I mean, you got not just the fire and the torture, but you got demons doing f terrible stuff to people and eating, oh, it's just, it's, it's, it's like nightmare on Elm Street with an eternal vengeance. It's, it's terrible stuff. But here's the thing. I mean, that is the, the dominant view of hell throughout the church tradition, and there's some scripture that seems to back that up, that it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. Uh, for example, in Matthew 25, Jesus says the wicked will go to eternal punishment and specifically mentions a fire there. In 2 Thessalonians 1, it says that 
uh, the wicked will be punished with everlasting destruction, using that same word, ionion, everlasting destruction. Hebrews 6 says the wicked suffer eternal judgment. And so there seems to be some biblical backing to this idea that the unredeemed will suffer excruciating pain forever and ever and ever. It is, if you think about it, with any kind of depth and authenticity, the most nightmarish thing imaginable. As a, as a young child uh, in a very conservative Irish Catholic school, uh, they talk quite a bit about hell in second grade. The nun went on and on and on about hell. Um, and I began to have these terrible, terrible nightmares. I, I was like on the inside of a volcano, down this like pit, and there's a little ledge that I was standing on. My feet were half off of it, and there's there nothing to hold on to, so my back was up against the wall. And I'm just trying not to fall down, because beneath me, a ways down, is this molten lava, this red, orange, it, it's fire, it's like liquid fire. And I look down there, and there are people that are just screaming bloody, excruciating, you know, murderous things, and they're just in pain. And I'm terrified. I'm trying not to fall. And then these two demons in typical second grade, you know, pitcher, the horns and everything, come up and they're laughing at me and they start to taunt me. They start to kind of like push me, trying to get me to lose my balance. And I'm aware that if I fall into that pit, which is inevitable now, I will never, ever, ever get out. And I would wake up and my heart would just be pounding. It was, I, was, I was in sweats. It was, it was just a nightmare. The worst imaginable nightmare. And the question is, that I want to wrestle with here is, is that nightmare accurate? Now, what makes this passage even more disturbing is that the guy in hell can talk to the people in heaven and they can see one another. And that actually has also been part of the church tradition about hell. I remember when I first came out, I was reading Tertullian, a second century theologian, and all of a sudden he starts talking about one of the delights of heaven will be watching the torments of the damned in hell. And he goes on and on and on about it. Uh, he goes, these gladiators, you know, they, they, they bring us to the Colosseum and they torture us and set us on fire and feed us to lion and they have such a good time, uh, but they don't know their time is coming. And someday we'll be in the stands watching them get tortured, but it'll be throughout eternity. Woo! And then St. Thomas Aquinas, middle-aged theologian, does the same thing. That one of our, we will watch the just damnation of the unredeemed and it will be part of our joy. I don't get that. I'll just confess to you, I don't get that at all. Um, to be able to see this happening, I don't care how evil someone is, how terrible they are, how much you hate them, how, you know, watching somebody in flames get tortured, uh, well, maybe for an hour or two, okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, <laughs> but after a year or 10 years or a, a million years, wouldn't it start to get old? Can we turn the channel? I mean, this is getting boring. I, I, I just, I, 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 don't, I don't get that. In fact, what if you see somebody you know? What if you see somebody you love? Down there, hey, Charlie, sorry, uh, you know, I should have witnessed to you more, I guess, I don't know. I, 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 how can you go on enjoying heaven when right outside your door, just down the block, are people being tortured in flames, being burned alive, but they won't get burned up? That is difficult. And what if it's somebody you love, your child, who didn't make it? And then, I, then there's this. I find that the, the more I grow in Christ, and I'm sure you found it too, the more that... You start to not just love your loved ones, but you start to love even your enemies. You start to develop a compassion for everybody. You just have a love for people and, and, and hatred and animosity and the desire for vengeance goes out the window and you just have this love even for your worst enemies. And I'm thinking that in heaven that will be perfected, right? So in heaven I'll be loving all of these people. And now I'm really wondering how am I going to sit there and enjoy the banquet supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb when there's people that I love uh, being tortured. And then I've got to wonder, however, good, however much our love will be perfected, God's love is more than that. So he, God created them and died for them. So now I've got to really wonder, how is God going to enjoy heaven while this torture is going on forever and ever? And then it leads to a whole bunch of other questions, and I'm just being honest here. I'm just thinking out loud. I think these are legitimate questions. Three other sets of questions that I want to just raise that have to do with the Bible. How is eternal punishment consistent with the biblical theme that you find all over in, in a lot of different ways, that God's anger lasts for a moment, but his love, mercy, and favor lasts forever? How do you put those things together? 
Guys, anger endures for a moment, but his mercy endures forever. If people are tortured forever after they die, it seems to me that the 